This was so 90s that even the decade in the 90s finally threw up its collective hands and said, okay, lads, this is a bit much even for us. Let's back it up a bit, shall we? Fear Street Part 1, 1994, is the first in a trilogy of Netflix originals directed by Lee Janiak, who directed Honeymoon, a nice atmospheric indie horror movie from about seven years ago. And this is based on the iconic, uh, long-running series of Fear Street books from author R.L. Stein. The first one came out in 1989, or 1980 Stein, if you will. And provided that pun did not cause every single viewer to shut the video off in disgust, I want to give a little bit of backstory before I get too far into the review. Back in 1989, I was eight years old, and when the first Fear Street book came out, I was really excited. Like, I remember, you know, getting it from the local library, back when libraries really meant something. And I was really excited because it was young adult stuff. I was like, ooh, I'm not the target audience. Ooh, blood, possession, ghosts, all this, serial killers. And, ew, why are these people kissing? This is gross. You know, because when you're eight years old, you don't necessarily think about that. Some people do. I didn't. But, you know, you hear about that and you let your imagination run wild. And you're like, oh, really, really cool. And I remember in the 90s and even the early 2000s, any uh, people I talked to that like to read books would always get in discussions and sometimes, you know, verbal eviscerations over whether R.L. Stein or Christopher Pike were the best young adult novelists. Um, because both were pretty goddamn popular, at least to me and people, you know, I, and as far as book sales, they did pretty damn well. And I remember enjoying Christopher Pike books. I also enjoyed R.L. Stein books. And he did the Goosebumps series, More for Kids, and led to a series that has ups and downs. But as far as Fear Street, it, any body of work is going to have some bad, and Arl Stein has certainly had his share of stinkers, but he's also had quite a few good ones, and there's been a lot of, you know, ones that turn into short series, one in particular that I'll reference here in a bit that has ups and downs, but there were, and then he got into more adult stuff that was hit and miss, but again, you're going to have that when you're an author that has a long career, but I was pretty excited to see this because it was going to hit the nostalgia vein. Because I had a lot of those Fear Street books, and I had a lot of Christopher Pike books, and I ended up having to sell them when I moved out a number of years ago, and it was what it was. So I was like, all right, I, you know, I might as well get rid of them. I got a pretty good chunk of cash. So that's back when paperback books actually meant something. Maybe I should have held on to them, and I probably could have gotten any, uh, a bunch more from collectors. But anyway, I was excited to see what they were going to do here. And since R.L. Stein is one of my favorite authors, I wanted to see how director Lay Janiak was going to do. And I will say that this, uh, it, it's the first of three movies. It's 1994, the next one next week is 1978, and then the one the following week is 1666. Now, I do want to say if you're a fan of R.L. Stein's books, if you've read the Cheerleader Saga, congratulations, you know the plot for this. I'm not going to get into too much more detail, but for R.L. Stein fans, that's pretty much the baseline I can give before I get into spoilers. So the opening line is, uh, it began as a prank and ended in murder. Oh, I'm always having that problem. Um, anyway, but the nostalgia of, since it's in 1994, obviously cell phones are not, you know, running rampant. And, you know, they're having to answer the phone and stuff like that. And those old brick goddamn phones that you could kill somebody with. I mean, I, it, if you ever dropped that, if you were ever talking like to somebody, you know, like holding it up and everything, and if you dropped it on your head, it hurt. Um, as a child of the 90s or a teenager of the 90s, I can definitely tell you. But um, there's a book, there's a girl at a bookstore, and things go basically tits up when the mall closes down for the evening, and it turns out that there is this killer called Skull Mask. As far as creativity goes, it didn't go to the names of the killers, but this is also young adult stuff. And from there, there's a group of friends, and there's Deanna, uh, Dina rather, who is trying to get over a lot of, you know, a lost love named Sam. Not lost as in they passed away, but as in a breakup. And she's kind of down to dumb. She's got a brother named Josh who's a bit of a nerd. And he's on this thing called the Inter the Information Superhighway. Something called the Internet? Whatever happened to the Internet? I mean, it was just a goddamn fact. I kid, of course, 1994, got that dial-up noise. Thank God they didn't have that dial-up noise. There. If you're too young to know what dial-up is... Oh boy, just be happy you never had to endure it. But there's the two towns of Shadyside and Sunnyvale. And right there, that hit the nostalgia bank. Because Shadyside is where all the bad shit happens, and Sunnyvale is where all the, you know, the good shit happens. It's like Shelbyville and Springfield, or Hatfields and McCoys, or, you know, like a whole bunch of other stuff. It's like, you know, this classic rivalry. And there is a curse placed upon the town of Shadyside. And it turns out to all go back to this... Um, this witch named Sarah Fear that placed a curse on this town all the way back in the 1600s. 
And this information is found out by the character Josh uh, Benjamin Flores Jr., who actually is, uh, he's probably, I think he's probably one of the most fleshed out characters in this. In all seriousness, there's a group of five friends that are actually probably the best characters. Everybody else kind of just feels like they're just there to advance the plot such as it is. But it turns out there's this, you know, witch Sarah Fear that, you know, is... That may, be, that may be causing, you know, these, uh, these you know, horrible acts to occur. And as information comes out, perhaps one of these friends is being targeted. And obviously, if you've read any of the books, and as I reference the cheerleader saga, you know where this is going. The instant I heard the name Sarah Fear, I was like, well, I haven't read the books in a number of years. And I knew where it was. And I just checked, I googled just to make sure, and I was like, oh, that's where it's going to go. So I will say that I have a feeling this series is going to go up and down. At least it's not going to be five books like the Cheerleader Saga was when it should have been maybe three. <laughs> but it was, those books were what they were. This is obviously, you know, visual because, you know, you can, you can use your imagination reading books. This is from people that are clearly fans of the Fear Street books. Uh, Leigh helps write with a guy named Phil uh, Grazadia, um, who it sounds like a word, pasta dish. And then her, Phil, and a guy named Kyle Killen uh, do, you know, do the story. So you can tell, though, that they do appreciate the source material. And I'm sure R.L. Stein had some, you know, gave his blessing and maybe was on set for some of this. Because you, it hits some of the right notes. So before we get into spoilers, it does hit some of the right notes. The slasher aspect and the atmosphere of it and the nostalgia is pretty apt. And the fact that there are no cell phones, or at least cell phones weren't running rampant, so you had to call people. Yeah, I know prehistoric stuff, or you even had, you know, beepers, you know, pagers, that kind of stuff. That's that's really prehistoric shit. And since the internet was in its infancy, even though Josh is tied into it because he's one of those earlier nerds, um, and there's nothing wrong with that, being tied in on the internet, he's informed about this stuff and says there's been this series of stuff that's happening It's all time back to 1666. And then... And then there's the comedy. The comedy doesn't work. That's one aspect of this movie that I didn't like one bit. And it's not that the acting was bad. The acting was actually pretty solid for the most part. But something about the comedy just ultimately didn't... It ultimately didn't work. And that was a big sticking point with me. <clears throat> and... And so that was that was a bit of a downer. Now that doesn't mean that it took away from everything with the movie, but anytime the movie tried to be funny, eh, it didn't really work for me. And eh, acting wasn't bad. But one thing before I get into spoilers, and I will say, as far as covering the nostalgia and how it does, you know, from you know referencing a little Easter eggs and stuff like that, as somebody that hasn't you know read the books in a while, it does a pretty good job with it. And considering this motherfucking movie is only like about. 98 minutes before it gets to the end credits and it's the first of a trilogy there's going to be more to flesh out because it goes back to the beginning and then when it comes to the end stop but it also does a lot of 90s songs or songs from the late 80s early 90s now it does 12 songs that i managed to write down and once you keep in mind this thing is called fear street 1994 this is before i get into spoilers only happy when it rains by garbage came out in 1995 okay somebody didn't fact check Machine Head by Bush, Closer by Nine Inch Nails, uh, those came out in 94, okay. Uh, you know, Damn I Wish I Was Your Lover by Sophie B. Hawkins, that was a bit of an odd choice, but fit for the uh, scene, 1992. Um, Insane in the Membrane by Cypress Hill was in 1993. Creep by Radiohead, 1992. More Human Than Human by Rob Zombie, got played a lot, <laughs> and that was in 1995. White Town's Your Woman, that was in 1997. They weren't even trying. Sweet Jane by the Cowboy Junkies, 1988. That was actually, it was like the Don't Fear the Reaper, that remake by I, I, Gus something or other um, in Scream. And then Firestarter by Prodigy, 1996. Hey by the Pixies, 1989. The Day I Tried to Live, Soundgarden, 1994. Okay, so maybe it wasn't, you know, maybe they didn't fact check everything. But I will say that they captured the 90s spirit and they captured the slasher aspect. But also... People were made, it was also a movie of convenience, I guess, because a lot of times scenes would just take place and then they would go, there would be some cohesion and then there would be nothing. And it just got to the point where I was like, okay, I know why this is happening. Oh, we're just chucking a whole bunch of people in here because we have to like, you know, get this and we have to set stuff up for future movies. 
but sometimes it, it felt a little disjointed, but more often than not, they got it correct. Now I am going to get into spoilers, though, so just, you know, be prepared for that. Spoilers, 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 and do, do watch this if you're a fan of Fear Street, you know, movies, by the way, or Fear Street books, that is. But anyway, we're getting into spoilers. You still hear spoilers. Okay, so there's that guy's skull mask, and it turns out that he kills that bookstore employee because he uh, that bookstore wasn't carrying the new Christopher Pike book. That turns out to be the case. No, it's not that. He's actually possessed by the ghost of Sarah Fear. And, you know, why the fuck wouldn't an old witch uh, possess a guy that, you know, has a sex doll shop? Actually, I think it was a Spencer's Gift or a knockoff Spencer's Gift without using the name Spencer's Gift. Now I've used Spencer's Gift so goddamn often that I have to call it something else. Gift from Spencer's. Now that doesn't work. <laughs> so her and the weird doll guy die. He gets shot. The Shady Side Mall Massacre, and then we get uh, the credits. We get like 20 book references. Camp Nightwing, and a whole bunch of Camp Nightwing is going to be the next movie. And the instant I heard the name Sarah Fear, I'm like, fucking goddamn cheerleader saga, oh please. Because I remember being like a little bit shocked by that. But um, the old chat rooms, that was kind of funny. That did That did take me back. And Dina is a bit upset because she lost her love, Sam you know, a breakup and everything, because Sam moved to Sunnyvale. And there's usual angst and played by early, teen angst played by early 20-somethings, and it turns out De Dina's gay because Sam is a girl. But Sam isn't ready to confront who she is. <clears throat> oh, no. Shady side in Sunnyvale, they end up having a fight with this candlelight vigil and everything for the victims of that Shady side Mall massacre. And then Sam uh, ends up, they end up, you know, in a, in a car, like Sam ends up in a car with her boyfriend because she's trying to, you know, deny who she is. And there's that bus coming back from the vigil, from the game, and suddenly there's nosebleeds. Like, uh, Dina gets a nosebleed just as she's trying to t uh, dump out a cooler along with a, her friend Kate, um, who, you know, Julia Rywald, she actually does a pretty good job there. And they dump that cooler out while it causes a crash. This car crashes in the woods, and somehow, just by convenience, Sam manages to get her, put her hand in the uh, open grave, the not open, but open grave of Sarah Fear. So now she's cursed because she got some of her blood on that because she was having a nosebleed. Because nosebleeds are apparently running rampant in Shady Side, Sunnyvale side. So. There's the boyfriend, Peter, but he's all kinds of shitty. But no, it's not him. He is not the person that's the killer. Skull Mask was doing the stalking. The comedy, again, as I said, fell flat. <laughs> um, So Dina tries to go visit Sam in the hospital. They start shouting at each other. And Sam, you know, tries to cut her down, saying, you're just going to end up like your dad, all drunk and everything. And and they didn't notice that Peter ended up getting killed by the killer. And apparently the security in uh, hospitals in the 90s was absolute shit. And the employees took naps because how did they not notice Skull Mask, that name sounds so stupid, stalking them? And it's that Ryan guy. He's He was shot, but he's back from the dead. So there's a singing girl. After they steal an ambulance, by the way, they do steal an ambulance, which... Apparently GPS didn't exist in the 90s, so nobody knows there's an ambulance being driven around by teenagers played by 20-somethings. There's a girl named Ruby Lane that, you know, tries to slash the comedic uh, relief, Simon. And she gets shot, but she's a witch! She's bleeding black blood! And she uh, killed her BF and a whole bunch of people singing and everything in 1965. And then we get the research stuff from Josh. She's pulling out all this stuff and slapping it on the table. Camp Nightwing, 1978. Uh, massacre, you know, the camp massacre and everything. Kate's mom's sister was there. And then 1958, Harry Rooker was a milkman. Um, I swear that name sounds familiar, but I can't place the book. <clears throat> if you can, please tell me in the comments. He killed a bunch of housewives. 1935, the Humpty Dumpty Killer. 1992, Billy Baker. And in 1904, uh, Grifter, Guts, Girls, and so on. 1666, Cyrus Miller cut the, he was a pastor that cut the eyes out of kids. He sounds like a joy. And then uh, Dina and Sam have a bit of a heart-to-heart -heart and everything because, well, Peter's dead. So, hey, I can get back into your life now. You're ready to admit who you are. So it all goes back to Sarah Fear. Before the witch's uh, final breath, she found a way to cheat her death. By cutting off her uh, cursed hand, she kept her grip upon our land. She reaches from beyond uh, the grave to make sure uh, to make the good men her wicked slaves. 
And now I'm just thinking of wicked ways like garbage and thinking of being a wicked slave to Shirley Manson. And now I'm going to move on. Shirley Manson is in her early 50s. I would and you would too. Um, so Sam basically is being hunted by the witch because the witch got a taste of her blood. And knowing that witches like blood, apparently, she did that. <clears throat> and then we get the chain, 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 the grave of fools. And, you know, they find the grave and they try to, you know, bury the bones and everything. Feel it in my bones. And then, um, basically everybody goes off to try and do, to try and, you know, find out what's going on. And, oh, no, somebody, uh, the, this mass killer from Camp Nightwing's pursuing, but it runs by everybody else because it's being motivated by the witch ghost and it's got a taste for blood. So, <clears throat> they change, they decide to get rid of the blood that's got all of Sam's blood on it. You know, because she's bled and, you know, because of the accident. Nobody changes their clothes because it's the longest night in recorded history. They go to a high, they go to the high school bathroom and change clothes. And, um, so Sam and Dina end up getting together, which, you know, hey, it, I, I guess, I guess when you're being pursued by kill, ghostly killers, why not make out in a freaking you know, high school, high school room? You make me feel like me, not like a natural woman. So... Then they try to set a trap by setting the ghosts on fire. That doesn't work because they're ghosts. And trust me, saying ghosts on fire doesn't work, believe me, I know. And they, they decided, oh, Sam needs to sacrifice herself. Oh, wait, no, we read this article. This one person was a survivor, and she's not going to give up. She's going to keep fighting. She's a survivor. I don't think that's how the lyrics go. <laughs> and... They find out this, you know, the name of this uh, survivor. They try to call and leave her a message, all panic, while this killer's trying to do his best, hey, here's, here's, here's Johnny impression. And then she needs to die first, because that's what happened. This uh, girl, C. Berman, ended up dying and then coming back to life a couple uh, day or a couple days, a couple minutes later, and she was fine. So they go to the farm, the grocery store Simon works at. He's been employee of the month. Apparently, he's the only employee there. He must do a damn good job. And they say, hey, here's all these pills, because we're drug experts. Take all these in this order, and then when you die, we'll use EpiPens, adrenaline, to bring you back. Well, that goes tip, tits up, basically, because um, Dina and Sam have a bit of a heart-to-heart. -heart. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to find you are you are the way out. So Kate decides to set, uh, you know, skull uh, mask on fire. It's like ghost. It's like Ghost Rider skull mask. And then they realize, oh, the pills got spilled. Hey, here's a lobster tank, so let's go drown you in the tank with the lobster. Wait, we need to set the... Lo go, lobster! Be free! The lobster's just crawling away. Best performance in that scene right there. And then Kate gets killed by a cake slicer or bread slicer, which was hilarious. And then uh, Simon gets axed something in the form of an axe to the head. And then... Uh, Sam basically gets drowned, be forcibly, well, you know, uh, justifiably drowned to, you know, get rid of the killers. They vanish. They save Sam, or did they? If you know anything about Arl Stein books, they always throw a twist at the end. And again, the cheerleader saga, do I need to hit you over the head with it? So we get interviews with the survivors. The cop is saying, well, I'm sorry I didn't believe you, da 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 And then Sam, uh, you know, basically... Uh, kisses Dina and her very in front of her very Christian mother, which was a cool moment. And they they made her she made her a mixtape that night. Oh, it's great! And oh, she finally gets a call from C. Berman, who just happened to find her number and says, "Well, hey, um, you you can't stop the witch. You may have stopped the killers, but you can't stop the witch. You can't. She'll find a way." Sam is possessed. Pretends to be shocked. Anybody that's read an article, anybody that's read a book, anybody that's been outside would have known that was going to come. But then Josh uh, is typing on the chat room and Dean is like, oh no, something happened. Oh, what happened? Sam got tied up, is a little tied up in the phone right now. Not like Nancy Benoit. Um, and she's trying to find a way to bring Sam back. Um, and then Josh and Dean are talking to C. Berman. And we get Camp, uh, Camp Nightwing trailer and that's basically it. So that's your movie right there. Yeah, a bit of a long review, but I had to get a little detailed. Let's see how the next two are. Hopefully they're... It gets a B. It gets a B because it hit the nostalgia well, but yeah, the comedy really did bring it down. I was hoping to like it a whole lot more than I did, but I did like it um, at least enough to give it a B. Anyway, agree, disagree, what I said, like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Rethlin. I'll see you soon.